Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm super excited to be here. It's my first time in OSS in Europe, so I don't know if there's any first timers in the crowd here, too. But yes, I'd love to see it. Um, we're going to have a great time, and I hope that you all take something away from today's session. Um, but before we get started, let's get to know each other a bit. Um, where are we all coming from? Just shout out. I'm from New York. Have, have, yes, Miami in the house. Hey, OK. Pakistan, OK. OK. I love that. We have representation all over the world here. Algún local es aquí? OK, uno. <laughs> now I know who to hit up for all the Spain recommendations. He's in the back. Get him. Um, well, he's local to Spain, but awesome. Great to see that there's diverse minds here today. We definitely need more of your opinions and, and making sure that we're stewarding this conversation around ethical AI, especially now more than ever. So now pivoting to the topic of ethical AI, by show of hands, who here cares about the impact of AI in current and future generations? I'm assuming your attendance says yes. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, you're in the right room, but I also encourage you to invite your colleagues who may be on the fence about what eth ethical AI means, may not understand the impacts, especially in marginalized communities. They are the ones that need to be here the most because often in these circles that we, we see echo chambers, and we don't see a lot of representation and the contrary opinion of whether these um, conversations need to be happening in the first place. But you are already um, here, and that's the first step. And congratulate yourself on that. Um, now let's get started. Welcome to Kiana's talk. As open source tech leaders, you have a unique opportunity and responsibility to ensure that AI is used in a way that promotes diversity, equity, and inclusion. Today, Kiana Berry from Red Hat will examine how the rise of AI can create opportunities but also perpetuate existing biases and systemic inequalities. She will also explore how the open source community can address these challenges. Join us as we co-create solutions to promote responsible and ethical use of AI. Oh, that was my cue? I'm not even going to lie. I was ready for her to take over this whole talk. <laughs> Anyone else have some like, anxiety around public speaking and wishes they could just outsource that to a digital clone? Yeah, definitely me. Um, well, we can do that now, actually. There's, there's technology out there that allows you to uh, take a replica of yourself, and actually now you can speak in any language and access markets and, and uh, areas of the world that you wouldn't previously have access to, because imagine the span of a human lifespan, how many languages you can learn versus how much your clone can learn. So it's really exciting, but it's also troubling to know that mass harm and mass disinformation can be propagated in the wrong hands. So this technology, um, as much as it is exciting, we have to also think of the opposite side, about what does this mean for infringements on people's rights. We see this in an example of Hollywood right now, um, where uh, the likeness of actors are being replicated now to be um, used without actors' consent. And this leads to unfair wages and um, issues like that that can also pose um, harms for um, um, those individuals as well. So a 22 report on trust and technology found that 65% of people worry technology will make it impossible to know if what people are seeing or, or hearing is real. I don't know if you all experienced that, but I share this example to show that just deep fakes alone is, an, is an, if, an issue that shows the red pill and blue pill situation of AI, where we need to make sure that uh, the no matter what pill we take, each side of each reality is going to be one that is responsible and with ethics in mind. So some of my a reflection on my why and the inspiration for this talk was the godmothers of AI who've been warning about AI. I'm not sure if any of you recognize any women in this picture. These are extremely powerful women in this space that have contributed to ethical AI. And um, so some have even risked their careers on the line. Timonet Gebru being one who was famously, famously outed after her paper in LLM challenged a tech giant. Um, and uh, after that, it just exposed the fact of how women need more protections, especially whistleblowers who are going to call accountability on um, issues around ethical AI. So I'm here just to play my small part as a technical product manager, as a woman of color. I see the potential to innovate, but I also see the potential for harm. So my goal here is to use this platform, God bless you, to advocate for marginalized communities. And I'm grateful for the Linux Foundation and Red Hat for making a safe space to have these tough yet important conversations. And I also just want to highlight that if you ever felt like you had imposter syndrome when in the, these conversations and rooms around ethical AI or just AI in general, know that every walk of life is needed in these spaces. And it doesn't matter if you have a technical background or not. I came from anthropology. 
and even more reason I should be here because you're thinking about things from a human lens. So I think that just want to break down that silo of thinking that you have to come from a technical school of thought to have value and have opinion in these spaces. So why should you care? AI bias has wide-ranging consequences for society and our uh, economy, ecology, and planet. Data privacy is one issue that affects everyone regardless of what your, your background is. It's something that we all have to face related to policies that are uh, prioritized for profit rather than for actual security of the masses. And algorithmic bias is another issue that we have to deal with and affects everyone regardless of your background simply because lower trust in the products that are put out there only means that these products will go unused and products that are unused with low trust means that these are just causing sustainable implications for the environment with tools that nobody's actually using. Um, also on the socioeconomic inequality level, we have to make sure that we're involving everyone into um, these conversations, but also into the products that we're building for them. If not, not only people are not adopting these tools, but we don't really get the full range of the value of building technology truly that is for everyone. So this is the thesis for my talk, is AI the enemy of DEI? But I'm curious to hear your opinion. Hands up if you believe AI is 100% the enemy of diversity equity and inclusion. How many think that it depends? Okay. Um, how many think AI is not at fault at all? Okay, like that, rebellion. Um, so I will answer that later throughout my talk, but I just wanted to get a pulse check on what, what, what y'all think of, of this. So here's the agenda for today. My focus for this talk will be on breadth, not depth. There's a lot to cover, so I will try my best to get through everything. Um, but I will also try to have poll checks throughout. Do try have your phones out. This is definitely not a talk where uh, your phones can be down. I want you to be engaged and chiming in any way you can. So quick AI 101 for those who come from a non-technical background. Um, think of AI as a stackable doll, where on the outermost doll, AI is an overarching field aiming to create intelligent machines. Machine learning is like the doll inside of that that is a subset of AI that focuses on developing the algorithms to make predictions based on data. And this can be either through statistical methods or other means. And deep learning, finally, the innermost doll is a subset of machine learning that employs deep neural networks for tasks that involve complex patterns and massive data sets. And we see that with things like LLMs. So now understanding AI on a societal level, we are currently at a turning point for the AI's renaissance. AI is transforming the way that we live and work, similar to how it was in the Industrial Revolution. Fun fact, the history of AI began with a woman, and her name was Ada Lovelace. She wrote the first algorithm in 1843. Another key turning point in the history of AI was when the Turing tests happened in the 1950s. Fast forward to recently, ChatGPT has now made history reaching 100 million users in just two months, beating WhatsApp and Twitter. Whether we like it or not, AI is omnipresent. It's in our home devices, our smartphones, our cars, our homes, our workplaces, and even in some people's bodies. AI is a vast field, and I see it kind of like a taxonomic branching tree, where at the base is human intelligence that is being replicated by computer systems. And these um, intelligent human-like tasks include things like learning, reasoning, problem-solving, perception, and natural language processing. So within the deep learning um, process that I mentioned earlier, LLMs are specialized in natural language understanding. From BARD to Bing, you may have interacted with LLMs and not have even noticed it. Um, and really, they're resembling the brain process to help process large amounts of text data. These are the patterns and relationships that you see, that are the lines that are, are intertwined resemble the brain, and they help with predicting things like the next word or for generating new content. Think of it like in Google Autocomplete when uh, a new word pops up. The problem with this, though, is that large language models like ChatGPT are now big enough that they've started to display startling, unpredictable behaviors. I don't know if anyone has heard, for example, where um, the Google chatbot taught itself Bengali, and they had no idea how that even happened. But um, it's just an example of like, imagine actually you know, building something for a specific purpose and then it ends up doing something entirely, self-teaching entirely different. That, that's kind of scary if you were to think of it in terms of the harms that can um, ensue from that. But this, this case, knowing another language, definitely on the positive. Um, one checkpoint though on the topic of LLMs is that the bias introduction and model creation is like finding a needle in a haystack. It's very difficult to weed the bias out. 
um, especially also with the, the weights that are introduced to the neural networks, these influ um, influence how the outputs would be. So this is various ways that bias can be introduced in the process. So further looking into how bias is introduced, let's think about it on a much larger picture. Studies show women's account for how much, you, how much percentage of women do you actually think that is uh, represented currently in the AI industry? If you were to guess, throw out a number. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. It feels like that. <laughs> like, shish. Um, I heard 20? Okay, well, I, I, I love that we lowball on it because we do need more representation, but it's actually 22%, which I'm like, I need to go back check that stat because I feel like it's lower. But I, I did actually check that the studies show there's 22%, not enough, um, and it's no secret that the AI industry is currently dominated by, no offense to anyone in the crowd, white um, and Asian men, which can lead to lack of diversity and inclusivity in the development of AI technologies. There's no problem with um, the fact of recognizing the need that we have to grow and diversify the industry. But it's just, we need to be intentional about it. So now let's zoom all the way out and reflect on biases on a human level from the origins of the uh, beginning of time. AI uh, bias can be traced back to our ancestry as humans. Primates, for example, created tools that have an environment to make daily life easier, such as hunting, collecting, water weapons, and shelter. Humans built tools to navigate the wild world, and now we build tools on digital screens to navigate the World Wide Web. As we shape our tools, our tools shape us in the process, and AI is no different. The tool shapes the way we think, behave, and interact, and even show up in the world. So our evolutionary past is ripe with cognitive biases, and these get baked into the technology that we build. One example of such biases is group biases, which is exhibited by primates. These primates lead to discrimination that um, any new members to, the, uh, to a particular group are actually, like mean girl syndrome, are ex excluded purposely for the safety of the group. Oh. This is a, a behavior exhibited by primates and just an example of how biases that had evolutionary purposes now find their way into how we show up in the world as humans and how we build technology. Now, understanding our past and their evolutionary history and how LLMs can be one step of the process of how biases can be baked in, uh, looking at a holistic picture and understanding how the different layers of bias manifest in production, we see a domino effect here of bias data leading to a time bomb um, that is only going to manifest itself later in the production when the user is actually interacting with this product. We want to make sure that we mitigate it in this process and have QA every step of the way from the problem formation, from the data to the model that we choose, and even in the organization. These are just some of the ways that one can be mindful of. Another checkpoint for bias and training process is, I'm not sure if you heard of the teacher-student dynamic of what happens in the training model process. Do I have any AI engineers in here, by the way? Oh, let's go, okay. So if I'm saying something crazy, please do correct me. <laughs> but I did research this heavily. But anyways, so, ooh, some clapping. Um, so uh, for bias in the training process, uh, reinforcement learning, is one way of uh, helping train a supervised policy, as we see here through the chat GPT training. This is directly taken from their docs, by the way. Um, so the way they do it is that you have a teacher's bot and your learner bot, um, and just simplifying it. And uh, what happens is that the algorithm's goal is to maximize rewards for a particular outcome. So uh, you say that the labeler is just acting like a teacher, is demonstrating a desired output behavior. The student then goes and learns, and the teacher tests against it to see how well it performed. After the, the um, student actually did it correctly, it's giving a reward. And instead of a good grade or a star or a sticker, good job, the reward is a numerical reward. Um, I found this interesting because this works very similar to the psychological uh, philosophy of classical conditioning, where um, similar to how we train our pets or where we train our children, um, we give them a reward and they do something well. And we, um, so that the behavior is reinforced, and that's the same way that algorithms are learned to train and create policies that um, help mitigate against harms um, or also de any desired outcome. So what about bias of the end user? We looked at, you know, from the model process and from the LLMs process and then also from organization structure, but and in the and the, tool, the tools are in the wrong hands, you're always gonna have bad actors who jailbreak software from pishing to an extreme and terrorism. Um, in the green, we see significant de decrease in disallowed behavior in GPT-4 by 82%. Um, and what this, this means is that 
uh, with the GPT-4 model, it introduced a billion more parameters, and this meant that they were gonna have more, um, more uh, stringent rules around what was gonna be allowed in terms of the prompt, because before, you can actually re reverse prompt engineer it and, and ask for it to undo um, some of its training so that you can expose it to make a recipe for a bomb, make a you know biological weapon, uh, use research journals to reverse engineer and make um, a disease on purpose. Like, it was crazy what you, what you can do with it, but now, um, GPT-4 had corrected a lot of that, which um, I thought was Quite interesting to see. However, I'm not sure if any of you heard recently, Stanford did a study and showed that GPT-4 actually is showing up to be dumber um, than it was before. So it's like, it's a trade-off that one has to have um, in balancing both bias mitigation but also actual functionality of the product. So now, I just wanna hear about what's your depiction of ethical AI before I actually give the definition. So if everyone take, the, take out their phones and just scan a QR code and let's make a little word cloud, just to see. I think, as a, especially as, as a collective community, we all need to be continuously defining and questioning ourselves. What is our definition of ethical AI? It can constantly be changing, but as long as we strive to have one consistent goal of what that means for us, then it's something that we can work towards and create policies around. So, while that's loading, and I'll, I'll let you do that, I will give it a second and move on to Actually, what I'll do is I'll present it at the end, so definitely just put in your ideas and then we'll look at it t together at the end. Um, but not to give you the, do think of, your, think of it on your own. I'll give you actually one more second before just telling you. Okay, so ethical AI is artificial intelligence that adheres to well-defined ethical guidelines. But what people think is that there's actually legislation attached to it. There's, there's not actually any legislation that has to adhere. Um, it, ethical AI, rather, is about fundamental values, such as thing as human rights and privacy. But it is not limited to what's permissible by the law. So that's one key, key clarification I wanted to, to make. Now, understanding the ethics, what are the cases of AI ethics gone wrong? On a high level, any AI detection tools that are used to reproduce racism and class inequality leading to discriminatory outcomes in health, to hiring, to lending, education, and law enforcement are all indicative of technologies that are exploited for bad. The biggest cons with AI are trust, disinformation, data privacy, and weaponization of data to exacerbate inequities in human populations. I interviewed ChatGPT to see its awareness on its flaws around targeting communities of color. And the output was pretty good. Um, I, I asked how, in what ways could it be exploited to target communities of color, and the first thing I got was that it's susceptible to be hacking vulnerable individuals who are less tech savvy, um, including those who maybe not have English as their native, native language, uh, elderly, um, uh, young teens. Um, also, they said they admitted that deep fakes were also a, a problem being especially those who are vulnerable and look to the news for um, information about politicians. This is something that um, can also be um, used as a tool to sway the public's opinion and cause civil unrest, as we've seen um, in, we've seen play out, I'm not gonna say their name. Jo job displacement was another one. Um, job displacement can automate and disproportionate impact on lower income and less educated, as, as we're all unaware of. And finally, I mentioned biased algorithms, such as facial recognition uh, algorithms that have been found to have higher error rates, particularly for those with darker skin tones. So I thought it was pretty solid response from ChatGPT to have awareness of itself of how it can be exploited. I would add, though, that data privacy is also something that's extremely important and is a con. Um, and you know, folks who are in cybersecurity, which I know <laughs> you are, would, can attest to that as well. So now, we looked at some of the high-level overviews. Here's some actual recent headlines. Because I'm in New York area, and I am involved in a lot of ethical AI uh, groups there, here just, I have two related to um, New York in particular. The robotic police dogs is something that is one of the most problematic introductions and what our taxpayer dollars are going to right now that uh, are now patrolling the city. And imagine what that would mean for, um, one, not having any observability into the data of what these dogs are being trained on and how they can weaponize and just target communities of color. Imagine just, you know, you're walking 
home alone at night and you just have this dog come up on you and, you know, y yeah, it just, it's, it's not going to pan out well. And it's not going to pan out well, especially for communities of color that are often disproportionately chosen um, when in between in the lineup, between a, a fair skin tone person or a darker skin tone person, that's not going to fare well. So it was one of the most shocking um, introductions, but also one of the, um, what happened recently in Detroit, uh, Portia Woodruff, an eight months pregnant woman, six cops showed up to arrest her and she was detained in a jail cell for 11 hours, all because an AI driven software program mistakenly matched her to video footage of a carjacking. Imagine if that was like a family member of yours, that could have easily, easily been a miscarriage and it's no excuse for uh, the haphazard, uh, um, judgment of the police officers, but it also just goes to show you how overestimation and overtrusting of AI is problematic in real time. Um, further than this, uh, I did more digging and, and found that the NYPD actually signed a contract for $8 million with the AI company that will now monitor online behavior. So every social media post that you ever put will now be used against um, tracking and predicting your uh, future behavior and prediction, projection of crimes in the future. So, you know, every selfie you ever took, I don't know, you may look, start looking like a suspect. That's basically what, what, how, they, how they're thinking and how they're acting. Um, and then the last one, disturbing, you can read on your own account. Um, so yes, uh, the biggest threat though that we're seeing, in addition to the ones that I've mentioned, are this bad AI that is gonna lead to extension of the human race if we don't put necessary checks in place. We've heard from the godfather of AI, God, Godfrey Hinton, for example, and he, he left in, in warning about the dangers of AI. But where do we draw the line in, in, in creating a tool or a monster? And this godlike AI is something that even led to something as the, the pause of the giant, giant AI experiments of the open letter. I'm not sure if you heard about it. 30,000 people signed up. Elon Musk was famously one of them, although his intentions were definitely dubious. Um, you know, whether you're looking to regulate competition or actually you're, you're genuinely caring about the societal impacts is up for debate. Um, and since then, the letter has been heavily criticized. No action really has ensued from it, but instead there's this new um, letter that's going around that uh, top CEOs of, of top, top tech companies have actually signed on in addition to the research labs that are funding it. So this one's looking more promising, but what it's gonna come to from it is still up for debate. But it's one thing is clear that um, big tech CEOs definitely want to get ahead of these regulation conversations for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, we want to make sure also that, um, especially as open source leaders, that we're included in these conversations as well um, and represented. So now, we look at the negatives. Let's actually reflect on what are some of the good news? What, what can especially communities of color uh, benefit from the societal impact around um, AI? Well, AI is a powerful tool. Um, it helps bridge the gap in humanity's knowledge and can lead to new discoveries and uh, breakthroughs that have previously been inaccessible to humans, whether through lack of time, lack of capital, lack of resources. Um, and now having the opportunity, for example, um, to analyze tons of data, like um, human trafficking, for example, one of the, uh, oops, for um, human trafficking, computer vision is utilized often to help um, detect um, through public cameras in various countries where individuals are migrating or being moved to. And especially for black women, even right here in the US, where disproportionately being um, uh, trafficked, this is something that can really pose as a benefit for um, these women in, in tracking their whereabouts and being able to have a chance at rescuing them. Um, but also, in, of course, in countries and, and all over Africa and Asia that where we see human trafficking numbers um, at all-time highs, even now more than ever, especially during the pandemic. But computer vision is one type of AI that can help, to, as I mentioned, in this, in this regard. But also just looking back in, in, a broader, um, in a broader way, also education is something that we see now being a possibility um, it be, with the accessibility of information, whereas people had to pay for a tutor, especially communities of color. Most people cannot afford to uh, hire a tutor. So um, being a tutor myself, I've seen how having information, having one-on-one -on -one support um, can really mean the d difference between someone graduating or failing and having lifetime you know, crippling debt. So this is definitely a huge game changer, having the accessibility information, having a personal tutor to help communities of color uplift themselves and their families out of poverty. 
um, and help it be a greatest equalizer. Um, and also, the same way that productivity benefits all of us, it also benefits um, uh, the community. And when you're looking at uh, those black women, for example, are the, one of the largest entrepreneurial groups in the country, also the, one of the most highly educated. Um, and, but often they don't have the time, energy, or the funding to be able to dedicate their time to their businesses. So a lot of them just end up going under and tanking. So uh, a lot of things, have, I just went, came back from an event in Atlanta. It was about 20,000 uh, people of color, entrepreneurs. The biggest interest that I saw is that there's definitely an interest in um, upscaling, learning about AI, and using it to leverage it in entrepreneurship. So um, that's one sign of hope of we're not just um, aware now of the, of the biases that are there, but also trying to use it for our advantage as well, and we're not getting left out of the conversation. So that's for that. So more headlines on the positive. Um, some of the biggest uh, breakthroughs that AI can pose is uh, lung cancer detection. Lung cancer detection has been proven to be one of the more specific or accurate in helping um, relieve shortages, especially of healthcare professionals. Also, pneumonia detection has been another um, benefit um, in the healthcare aspect. Additionally, um, when it comes, we're looking at natural disasters, floods are the most common type of disaster, which 250 million people globally each year are affected and leading to 10 billion economic damages. We were just talking earlier about um, Pakistan and how there's like tons of flooding um, going on that now having AI be as a tool um, to help mitigate um, where these areas are going to be most affected so they can prepare they can help save lives in, in real time by knowing which areas um, will be impacted and then also using AI to prevent uh, balance and low vision there's a project like called be my eyes that um, will help those who are low vision um, access um, and have vision um, through the pairing of um, you know, individuals who do have sight, and that's just one of the ways that Google's innovating currently at the moment, um, just to talk about some of the, the benefits as well. So, now, we looked at it from the domestic level. What about the global level? We should take a global view, especially as open source leaders, and think about which countries are not in the room often of these conversations. We often see the U.S. as a big player, but what about the global south? Um, the pros of AI and humanity in a global context range from helping avert outbreaks of diseases to helping the disabled navigate the world around them, to yielding better crops. Um, one of the sustainability benefits that um, uh, AI has posed also is through the detection of uh, sounds in the forest. You can actually track where there's gonna be deforestation by hearing where the birds are. And so that's one of the ways that AI is helping also sustainability efforts. Um, in addition to, as you see in the, the indigenous um, women here, uh, there's been a lot of benefits in helping store the amounts of data that often are passed through oral tradition and get lost when, um, when members, of, members of the family died. Now there's a way um, through AI to help track um, these indigenous languages and also the culture and history surrounding this information. That's just an example of the benefits that AI can pose. However, we also have to look at the opposite and contrarian side where um, we, we see, unfortunately, um, I'm not sure if any of you all heard of the Kenyan workers that were used to train uh, uh, OpenAI's dirty data laundry. They were paid like cents in the dollar and were traumatized by a lot of the content that they saw. A lot of them had to, can't even afford to go to therapy, but as you see, there's a cost um, to, to AI and just being realistic about what that cost is and being aware on how we can uh, make sure that we're advocating for those who don't have voices or who have less privilege than we do, especially in different countries. But um, I looked at a study that, that looked at the negative and positive impacts of AI across the board, especially against the UN goals. Um, some of those UN goals are some, things like no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education. The good news is that the positive impacts actually outweigh the negative impacts um, against the UN goals that I mentioned. Um, that this is good news for us, but it's also meaning that we still have a lot of work to do. Now that we know the good and bad of AI, how do we keep balance to regulate the scale in our favor and just in a favor of equilibrium? There's various legal frameworks now that are rising to the response to these threats posed by AI. I'm not sure if all of you have been following the EU um, Act, that been, AI Act that's been going on. Um, definitely it's one of the most promising pieces of legislation, especially that it has penalization attached to it. Um, but since then, actually on the open source front, 
the Hugging Face, uh, GitHub, and Creative Commons all published position paper on the supporting of open source and open science in the EU AI Act. So this is good because they help represent it from the open source um, perspective as well. We often we're seeing um, the EU AI Act be more on the side of favoring corporations and less more of the open source voice. So that's why it's very important that we have uh, our input and we're actively involving ourselves in those conversations to make sure that we're also representing the open source community needs. Um, also, so for updates on, on the US side, um, the US Biden-Harris administration um, secured a voluntary commitment from leading artificial intelligence companies to manage the risks posed by AI. IBM was one of them, I'm happy to report, but um, additionally to that, we also have an AI Bill of Rights in the White House that has been instated. But again, all of these things have not, at least from the U.S. standpoint, do not have penalization attached to them. And you can only imagine, having all the rules in the world is not going to necessarily change behavior, especially if there's no slap, or slap on the wrist attached to it if um, you, you, they commit harms and there's no incentive to change the behavior. So we'll see how that poses for the U.S. But the EU is actually being a, a lot more brave about it in um, actually having the penalization and the fining attached if they were to break these harms. So I don't know if any of you knew, but there's actually a community called Linux Foundation AI and Data. And um, we have that within the Linux Foundation and open source community. And when I did this talk in Vancouver, I was surprised that people didn't know. And I'm like, OK, well, this is a great opportunity for you to network within resources we already have. Um, and they actually have is, uh, principles that they pr pr propose for trusted AI, and these are some of them. I think this is a great starting point that we can build off of, but it definitely shows us the opportunity. PyTorch is a community to be involved in, um, and um, I, I think that we already have all these resources available to us. We just need to access them and, and keep this conversation going. So similar to how governments regulate and scrutinize medical products, wow, this is a lot of words on the screen, my bad. Um, uh, we, we also have to scrutinize uh, our um, AI products similar to the medical products and processes that are set in place. This is my proposal of what an AI governance roadmap would look like for the open source community based off of just the data consumed um, and some of the resources I've, and research that I've been um, pouring over to see what can the, the open source community benefit most from. Feel free to um, look at it more, but I'm going to move on to the next slide and just like to also hear your thoughts on what you would propose for the open source community to resolve all the harms that I mentioned. How could we strike the balance between open source innovation, but also um, uh, guardrails in place that help steward the ethical AI development? Also, another thing that I recommend is that I, I mentioned earlier in the talk that there's multiple ways of bias seeping in from the model creation to the organization level to the evolutionary level. Um, now looking at it from a holistic view of how we can actually have a resolution um, around embedding ethical AI processes in the open source um, model, um, we just leverage the frameworks that are existing out there and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think we just leverage the partnerships similar to like, as I mentioned, on the global level, we can use the a EU AI Act and help advocate and help structure that so that we don't get left out of the conversation. On the US level, we can leverage some of the blueprint of, of AI for Bill of Rights and build off of that. On a nonprofit level, companies like, like I mentioned, PyTorch, Hugging Face, um, are all great communities to start from. Mozilla AI as well um, are great nonprofits that are seriously investing in this area and um, actually making sure that we're stewarding ethical AI development and, and putting money where their mouth is, which is the most, more important thing in order to steward um, good practices of AI. Um, on a corporate level also, IBM is doing a lot in this space with IBM 360. They've, they've uh, helped with also NASA, helping um, you know, democratize this information of research that was previously inaccessible and making it in a way that everyone can access. So um, I'm curious though, last question, if everyone take, what does AI solutions look like to you? We just take out your phone and just rate on a, on, um, a scale. I had some of them li already listed for you, just to, to hear about what the community thinks is the best approach for uh, having balance with an open source community. Um, and I will get to that later. All in all, um, tech requires a global approach and a global lens. So bring you back to the original question. Is AI the enemy of DEI? Yes and no. In the context of DEI, AI can be the enemy if it perpetuates existing biases and systemic inequalities such as discrimination against people of color, um, um, women and other marginalized groups. But ultimately humans are responsible for the, for the upkeep of the open source tools we put out into the world. So. Um, 
I've traveled to countries like Taiwan, um, Saudi Arabia, and Japan recently, which exposed me firsthand to the world of AI and robotics, further fueling my curiosity and my also anxiety around the rising advancements in AI's impact on BIPOC, BIPOC communities. In Saudi Arabia, they regard data as a new oil. In Japan, they're utilizing AI processes to now run whole governments and own towns. In Taiwan, as you know already, the, the semiconductor is a huge investment and now something that the U.S. is uh, to compete with. Um, so regardless of whether we want to be, we need to all reflect on if we're going to be the leaders in something, let's do it the right way and let's make sure that we're stewarding it with the open source community helping lead us in the ethical direction. So now I have a poem at the end, but I'm curious if you want to hear it. <laughs> Yes, I wrote it. It was not ChatGPT. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me to say that, because yeah, now people, yeah. Um, I just ask if anyone is to record, that please do tag me. But um, this was, yeah, I, I just wanted to have a, a representation. I think people coming from a technical background, we, we typically hear people talking, but I also like to express things in another creative way that maybe people from the arts background, English background can also relate with. So, all right. Um, here we go. Dear open source leaders and technology pros, heed these words as the future of AI grows. For although those AI's potential is great, its impact on humanity we must contemplate. Is AI the enemy of DEI? Spoiler alert, AI alone isn't the enemy. The real culprit is humanity, and especially those in the white ivory tower coding dangerous algorithms without input from people who look like me. The same tool that can enhance productivity can also be hacked as a weapon of destruction. It seems as AI advancements are peaking, our global governance is still under construction. Hold up, you mean the same tool that can help us automate and auto sentence an innocent person of color to jail? And bad actors can abuse AI to blackmail the innocent at scale? Unacceptable. We need guardrails to protect all people without fail. Don't get me wrong, though. You see, the tool by itself, the opportunities are endless, but the values and ethics are sold separately. Yes, AI can detect rare diseases, aid the blind sight, but the long-term impact on the underprivileged remains a mystery. Yet history is repeating itself from the Renaissance to the Industrial Revolution. We've seen this story before. AI's impact on the world is undeniable. Every industry will be shaken to its core. But as we learn to channel technology's disruptive power, we must ensure the fruit of our DEI labors won't sour. For now isn't the time to cower away from doing the work we ought to. We cannot allow this topian society run by robots who come true. AI holds up a mirror to society, magnifies our weakness, showing us the biases we have and the problems we must address. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Will AI amplify biases old or will it break down barriers so bold? Will it perpetuate inequality or create new paths for community? The answer is, it's up to all of us, for AI is only as just as the data is built upon to trust. Let today only be the beginning of the responsible AI conversation, for ethical AI is more than just a buzzword, but a lifelong obligation. I'm here to remind us, as we harness AI's great force, let us see the development of AI open source on the right course. For AI alone is not the enemy, but if we play our cards right, it can be the remedy. To build tech that benefits all humanity with transparency, fairness, and equity. Let's teach the next generation to approach tech with consideration, but on our part that requires deep contemplation. As a community, let's create the blueprint for AI governance as a future template that embraces DEI, not as a nice to have, but as a non-negotiable mandate. In conclusion, yes, the positive impact of AI can be immense, but we must consider the long-term consequence, for it can either build or destroy, depending on what we build, when and how we choose to deploy. Let's build wisely. Thank you. No questions. I have a up after that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys normally get poems after your talks like this? Huh? What'd you say? <laughs> Go for it. Did y'all like the poem? Okay. It's a little quiet here. <laughs> I'll tell you, I swear that was not ChatGPT. I, I, I like poetry. <laughs> I 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one has the answer, spoiler alert, but I do think that um, the only way that we're gonna know is by having a, at least a template, a baseline measure where we can start from and then we can grow to adjust as we go. I don't think we're ever gonna have to get it right, but if we wait too long and have no policies and no, we're just gonna have a wild west where continuously the people that get harmed are often gonna be you know, those who are already marginalized. So how could we not exacerbate that and set that in place by having, looking at history in the past, and then making sure that we're, we're learning from it and learning even other countries have implemented it further th than us. And then we can um, start with something and at, at least use it as a model for um, going forward and adjust as we go. That's, that's the only thing I can think of, but I'm, I'm not an uh, AI ethicist or PhD in this topic. It's just enthusiast, <laughs> but great question. I saw your hand up. Yes. Yes. Uh, how do you try to explain that to stop getting into a, a one-hour TED talk on why it's, it's getting dumber, but it's what you're right, and it's like, what the team has to do? They just care about functionality, and now all of a sudden, they, you know, they can't play around with it, even if they have a very small ensemble, but they don't actually care that the team is really, um, and like, what this is important to the team. How do you explain that? Well, ex explain that it's necessary. I think we all know that it's necessary to have some sort of um, uh, some sort of measures against the jailbreaks because people creating recipe for bombs and phishing attacks and stuff um, is is a no is a no brainer. But I get your point about how do we balance how do we balance the um, you know the the ethics with it? Because and, and I posed that question in that slide. I have I have a slide up about. Um, some of the jailbreak prompts that people used to be able to to do, and now with GPT um, four, the what the response would be. I think um, again, there's no there's no easy answer to how we can strike the balance. Just something that we have to do. But I I think that if we were to do it, we'd have to definitely um, beta test it. And I know that red teaming is something that internal corporations or companies have that they can experiment before they release these things to the public. I think that'd be a great uh, case study to, to learn from internally to see, uh, you know, pretend to be an exploiter of this technology. How would you use it? How can I, um, you know, guess and test and sample it where um, I finally get to a happy medium, a recipe for having the restrictions um, while not um, hindering the performance so badly that the technology becomes uh, just useless at that point. So I, I think you start internal and then bring that external and then um, <laughs> I see you laugh there. It, it's, I thought it was funny as well, but also scary that people actually do this. And I don't know if y'all heard about Worm G GPT and all that stuff going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you know, now that you say that, I was actually shocked that a Stanford study did not take into account that the reason why it's getting quote unquote dumber is because it's getting safer. <laughs> I was like, come on guys. But, um, but yeah, no, then, and that's why I called it out um, because I was just realizing that that's like, hmm, this is no longer being useful anymore if, um, but I think we're learning. We're, th we're definitely guinea pigs right now. Um, we're, we're, we're the, this is a large experiment and um, I think things will get better, but before they get so good that they're scarily good and they can be exploited, you have to make sure we have those guardrails in place to not let it run wild. Any other questions? Did y'all enjoy the talk? Did do you have any feedback? Mm-hmm. When you say senior, do you mean like senior as an age group or senior in a company? Oh, okay, let me think of my grandparents. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've definitely been like, come on, abuela, let's go. Like, you, you need this in your life. Um, no, I, I, I think it's one, if they want to do it, then, you know, that 
that helps in terms of making it receptive to it. Um, I know, for example, even with my mom, I, I tried to expose her to it. No, I don't want any of my information on the internet. Da, 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 da. Like, so it's either like you get super paranoid school of thought or, or so I show my, um, my older aunt and she, yes, teach me everything about it. I want to put everything in there. And I'm like, okay, like, you know, I was like, okay, I noticed that uh, the older you get, having more skepticism around what you put on the internet is probably for the best because um, a lot of people who are targeted are often those who are old and um, lo uh, lonelier and maybe don't have um, a lot of free time in their hands and, you know, want someone to interact with, which I think, you know, having the AI chatbot for loneliness features and, like, the psychological um, benefits of having kind of, like, therapy uh, more accessible for them is, is good. But in terms of forcing it on them, I don't, I don't think it's necessary. I think more so just like thinking about what your, your goal and your objective is. If it's like you want to introduce them to show them like, oh, this is the cool stuff out there, then you know, show it through action. Like, hey, here's what I built using ChatGPT. And then, oh, okay. Naturally, with that, that will stir an interest. And then I think that's how we should um, approach that even with, like I say, my younger siblings. I'm like, you guys need to know about this. And we're like, we already do. We're using it in school. And I'm like, no. <laughs> Um, no, nah, they're, they're good, good students, bright students. Yeah. But but they also hear about it, you know, and and um, immediately starts the bands. But um, it's good to just know and expose everyone in, around you to what's happening, so that we don't get left out of the conversation. I think the biggest thing is that we cannot have this mentality of fear let us stop and negate us from actually exploring. I think the best thing you can do right now is explore, know what's out there. We can't fear and and fixate on. We're being replaced. Oh my God, my job's gonna be gone. Like, if you're a part of it, if you're using it, you know how to 10x your workflow with it, and uh, you know how to like do sophisticated prompts around it. It's like you either kind of go with the tide or or get the roll. That's how I'm seeing it right now. So I think that's the best thing you can do is introduce. Sorry about the long windedness, but <laughs> hopefully that answered your question. Um, go for it. And thank you for coming, guys. By the way, enjoy your day. Ooh, Italy, you were the country that banned open AI, boss moves, let's go. I was like, okay, I see you. Okay, so to summarize that, how could you remove data from the model? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I knew too, because there's some stuff in there probably we all would want to take back. Um, no, I, in all seriousness, that's a really good question. Um, it's not one that I feel positioned to answer, but if I were to, my best guess would be that um, this is the part of the reason why policy is so important. If you force them to give up the data and force them to give us our rights to opt in in the first place, then, you know, instead of like retroactively like, let me get my data back when it's, it's, it's almost kind of too late, so to speak, to heart, go back and like track and label what was yours and imagine all the creators and all the legis uh, laws, suits that are going on right now, even for photographers, creators that now have to fight. It's, it's a mess right now, so it's, so it's a very interesting topic, especially in a legal standpoint. Um, you're looking at from creators. I think it's very hard to know um, and to find and see of data, your, your stuff, and I just think having better privacy rights, which I alluded to earlier about um, privacy, um, is gonna help with that, um, and doing it beforehand rather than after the fact is just gonna be the best way to approach that. Um, in terms of like Italy's model, I'm, I don't, I'm not as familiar with, with that. I, I, and I, I think 
definitely Europe is a lot more progressive and with even with GDPR and everything, just how they're, they're moving is definitely different in the US. Um, the US are like, figure it out, um, you're lost. But um, I think, yeah, just, that's just, that would be my best guess at that. Any last closing thoughts, feedback, anything? Thank you, and thanks for coming. You, did you wanna say something? Okay, sure, sure. Well, thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.